let's dive in. I, I'm really happy to have you here. Uh, my name is Mike Langford. Uh, I am an outside uh, marketing strategist that works with Pearl Capital. A fantastic team. We've been working together now for, uh, it's almost a year now. It's closing in on a year in the next couple of months. Uh, I really love the team there. I, I really believe in the things that they're doing for the ISO community uh, that really making sure that you have information and the tools you need to succeed in your business. And one of the things I want to make sure that you know is that if you do have questions or if there are things that you want to have covered here as it relates to marketing in your business, please let the Pearl team know or you can reach out to me directly as well. Uh, because we want to make sure we get everything you have, because if you're bringing in business, Pearl succeeds. And uh, again, that rising tide lifts all boats. We're all in this together. The title of this webinar is Niche Marketing for ISOs. How to increase sales by focusing your efforts on a specific target market. Uh, and we're going to go through a whole bunch of uh, stories that kind of bring that all home and some specific recommendations on what you can do in your, in your business. Pearl has... Uh, a variety of social media uh, platforms that they're they're active on. You see Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube. They're they're on as well. Instagram. Uh, have a chance go out there and follow them. Uh, our first webinar that we did together last year in 2016 was on the use of social media for uh, your ISO business. So please, uh, if you haven't heard that, uh, please go back and, and take a listen. Uh, if you have any questions specific to social media in your business, please feel free to send them over. Uh, we do have a hashtag for this. Uh, this, If you're a Twitter user and you want to let people know you're, you're joining this webinar and, and invite them on to, to come on in, or if you see anything or hear anything that is a nugget of good learning for you and you want to share it with your community, please go ahead and, and share that using the hashtag. Uh, all these social media accounts are managed by Grant Pastor. You see that uh, it's his name that's it, that is flashing here in the go to webinar, but it's actually me, Mike Langford, that's doing all the talking. Uh, he's just well, we're logged in under his his account. Uh, also, if you have a chance, if you're on any of those um, those social networks and you want to uh, you know uh, rate Pearl Capital, you give give them five stars, right? If anything you see a like, uh, if you want to uh, give them five stars where appropriate, if there's a, there's the ability to rank them as a company that you're working with, always go ahead and do that. I think they're doing a fantastic job, and I know how committed they are from top to the bottom uh, at the team to make sure that you're successful. A little bit about me. Uh, again, my name is Mike Langford. I run a company called FinServe Marketing. We do uh, marketing for financial services companies. So the, the, the concept of niche marketing and target marketing is really, really near and dear to my heart because I spend all of my time focusing on the financial services vertical. That's, that ranges from investment firms and, 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 and here into, into the lending space. Uh, it also, uh, with the one slight string outside of the lines of the... Uh, financial services vertical is technology companies that market into financial services vertical. So the, the real point before we dive in too deep uh, on everything is, look, having a niche market or a target market doesn't necessarily mean you won't accept customers or, or find customers that are outside of that bullseye, right, that you're looking for. What it does mean, though, is we're going to get a lot more focused with our efforts. And so, you know, I speak from personal experience that Instead of just saying, hey, I run a marketing agency and, and I help people with their marketing and I help them find new customers, being able to say that, listen, I know the financial services vertical. I, 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 I talk to people in that all the time. Uh, I have been a member of the financial services industry for 23 years. I really know your business. Uh, I'm excited about the business. I believe in the business. I know it's important. All that type of stuff really resonates and it helps me be more efficient and effective in my business. So I'm hoping that you're gonna get some of that here uh, in our talk today. Okay, so marketing 101. I had to put this in there because it's really funny. Like the, I've, I've encountered a lot of people over the, over the years that do not have a target market or, or a niche that they focus on. And it's really interesting because you know I remember back in you know college, you know, marketing 101, first is who is your customer? You have to articulate who's gonna buy from you. Who are you selling to? Uh, because if you, you, if you don't know what you're looking for, how are you going to find it? And no joke, if you go, you know, type in Google Marketing 101, you're going to find the Small Business Association website because a lot of the generic information for businesses will lead you to the SBA uh, website. And here are their four marketing tips, Marketing 101 tips, you know, understanding the needs of your customer, analyzing your competitive advantage, like what do you have over other people, 
to serve those customers, selecting specific markets to serve, uh, and then determine how to serve those customers. So like I said, it's you know, the SBA says it in pretty much every book ever written about marketing for small business talks about uh, you need to have a target market, you need a niche, you need to know who you're selling to. So let's go fishing. This is a, a fun story that actually came about uh, from, from personal experience over the last couple of weeks. Uh, so I have a 12-year-old son, and, and, and six years or so ago, we moved from Massachusetts here to Austin, Texas. And we used to go fishing a lot uh, up, in, up in the Boston area, lots of lakes and so forth. And, and our primary fishing was trout fishing. We'd just go down to the lake, throw our lines in, and we'd, we'd catch some trout here and there, get some donuts, of course, as all little kids love to have donuts by the lake. And so a few weeks ago, my son is like, hey, Dad, let's, what do you think about going fishing again? We haven't been fishing since we lived here in Austin. I'm like, that's cool. We've got a little pond in our neighborhood, and let's go on and get it, get it done. Uh, and, and lo and behold, fishing is different in Texas than it is in Massachusetts. Who knew, right? Like it's, <laughs> and, and, and the analogies you'll see really quickly relate to your business and, and frankly, to any business when they're trying to find customers, right? That not all customers are equal and not all ways of getting to the customer is going to be equal. So one of the things I found out, just kind of a fun little fact here, and this kind of relates as well, is that there are 1,200 species of freshwater fish in America. And it stands to reason that of all those fish, there's lots of them in, in rivers, lakes, streams, and, and what have you, some of them are different. They, they don't all eat the same stuff. They, they behave differently. Some of the water is warm, some of it's cold, some of the water is moving. You know, you see, you know, fast running rapids, you see waterfalls and so forth, and some of it's very still, and you see swamps and all the like. So there's lots of different species. And if we take into account ocean fishing, if you're going to go out uh, to the beach or go out deep sea fishing, or whatever, we're talking about a lot more species. So if our target goal is to catch fish, well, we've got to take a different approach depending upon what we're going for, right? Because the, the logic is, hey, listen, I need a rod and reel. I need a hook and some bait and boom, I've got fish. But it's really important, right? Number one, fish where the fish are. That's the old, oldest sales rule in the world is fish where the fish are, right? Don't waste your time uh, trying to sell the people, trying to go places where your customers aren't there. And it, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I think I use this, this analogy every single time um, I talk about uh, target marketing. You know, many financial advisors in my experience, and I'm sure you see this in your ISO practice, you'll see a lot of people going to the Chamber of Commerce meetings, the Rotary meetings and so forth. And those things are important. It's really, really important to be part of your community. But the problem is, it's so crowded with competitors, right? And many of the people in that room have already been kind of hit up, right? So they're, they're no longer fish, even though there are people there. They, they, you've kind of like outfished that pond, if you will. So you do have to kind of go where the fish are. But it's really, really important that you use the right bait. What are these people uh, eating? What's their thing? Okay. Um, so what's the difference between fish? So this is one of the things we've, we discovered uh, not too long ago here in Austin. So trout fishing, right? They live in cold water. They like rivers and lakes and ponds with rocky bottoms and so forth. Typically, it's, it's fly fishing or, or using worms or these things called salmon eggs or whatever. You just kind of throw them out there. But by and large, you know, the way I always grew up fishing was you just brought a chair down to the beach, parked it, you know, threw your line out and, and waited for a bite. Seems kind of logical, right? That's the way you fish. Well, it turns out here in, in Texas, bass fishing is the deal. Look at, people are like really, really into it, by the way, like over the top into bass fishing in some, some quarters. Um, and it's different. We went down there. I bought, I bought some worms and I, I rigged up the lines just the same way that we, <laughs> we, we did in Massachusetts. And lo and behold, we caught nothing, like literally nothing. And, and we're watching other kids catch stuff. And so finally, I talked to somebody who uh, looked like he knew what he was doing and so forth. And he kind of gave me the rundown on, on how to fish for bass. So you can use the same similar fishing rod if you need to, but you got to really change your approach, right? You can, it, so think about it. You've got the same general product, right? And you've got the same desired outcome. I want to fish, but I've got to change the approach. I've got to change the bait, right? Uh, you don't sit on the beach and just you know, cast out there and wait for something to eat. You, you cast over 
and over and over again. If you really want to get into this, you know, you need a bass boat too. You got to get up there on the water and kind of move around. It's not as easy to do bass fishing from the shore. So a really, really interesting analogy that applies directly to our businesses. So think about it. When I meet a lot of ISOs uh, and, and you talk to them, and this is similar to when you talk to a financial advisor or any other financial professional, they'll tell you, I service people who have money, right? Oh, I, I'm looking for small business owners. Well, there are 5.4 million small businesses in the United States. Are all small businesses really a niche? Like, can we say that 5.4 million businesses, uh, businesses that are generating under $5 million in revenue annually, can we really say that those are a niche, sort of, sure, uh, it's, it's possible. I mean, I know Bank of America has a small business banking and so forth, so they surely see it as a, as a target market. But when we get down into a smaller practices like yours, uh, how do you make sure that you're, you're zeroing in? Right? I mean, every month, 200,000 new businesses are born in the United States, 180,000 die, right? So it's a really big target market. Can we get a little more granular, a little more specific, and potentially drive better results. Let's see. I like widows. So a few years ago, I had uh, the honor of speaking at, at a conference uh, from Morgan Stanley. And Morgan Stanley, you know, they have a, they have 18,000 financial advisors across the country, and the top 15% are uh, get into what's called the President's Club. And that means they have to be generating at the time, I'm not sure if it's moved up or not since then, but at the time they had to be generating $750,000 of annual fee revenue, right? That's a lot of money. That's doing pretty well for yourselves. Most of them are doing well, well north of that. So there's a room full of like 300 financial advisors that are all basically doing a million plus a year. This is a pretty great room that I'm speaking in front of. And I look, you know, as I do, when you're up on stage, you tend to scan the room a little bit and you, you know, make eye contact with different people sitting at different tables. And I happen to notice this younger woman, and she's probably in her early 30s at the oldest, she's sitting close to the front. And I'm just fascinated because like, as you might imagine, most of the, most of the people in the room are dudes. It's, 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 you know, the joke is it's a sausage fest, right? It's like 95% men in the room. 95% uh, older guys, you know, middle-aged to older guys have been doing this for a long time. And so I really wanted to make sure I talked to this lady afterwards because she really stood out. So after my talk, I, I come down off stage and as luck would have it, she had come up, she had a question to ask me about LinkedIn and how to use it in her practice effectively. I said, I've, I've got to ask, like, tell me about your practice. I mean, how well are you doing? She's like, well, I do a million dollars a year. I'm like, my goodness, you know, how long have you been doing this? She's like, well, I've been in business for about 10 years now. Wow, that's a really fast, you know, ramp to a million dollars a year. And I go, so, so, what's your your customer? What's your target customer? She just looks me straight in the eye and she goes, "I like widows." Goes, what do you mean you like widows? She's like, "I built my entire practice on widows." She's like, "I got one client who's a widow. Her husband passed away, and she had no idea where any of the money was. She had no. She, he had done all the money management over the years. So I sat down with them." And with her, excuse me, and we went through everything and she became a client and it was a really good client. And wouldn't you know it, she also has friends who are widows. And so she started referring me uh, to widows and I started building up my practice and so forth that way. And she looks at me there, she goes, you know, a funny thing is no one has ever questioned my fee, which in the financial advisory business, that's a big deal. Like fees are, you know, 1% to 1.5% annually on the portfolio, that's not insignificant money. If it's a million dollar portfolio, you're paying you know, 10,000 or $15,000 a year for somebody to manage your money. So the fact that these widows are just so thrilled to have her in there and it's a very profitable business for her, it was really exciting. So why widows? We talked you know, a little bit about that. First of all, it wasn't just that it was an easy and she fell backwards into it. If you think about widows as a target market for her, there's a million women become widows every year in the United States. 66% of them are over 65. Right? Some of those, some smaller segment are gonna be wealthy. They're gonna have a lot of money because she wasn't looking for people with small portfolios. She's looking pe for people who have like half a million dollars or more. So she wants, she's, she's in the wealth management business. So that's pretty significant. 
that she's got this really well-defined niche. She knows how to find them. She's got this referral partner network of estate attorneys, morticians, slash funeral directors, however you want to call them, grief counselors and others. It's a really, really powerful niche that she's developed. And the more developed it gets, the more well-known she becomes as, uh, as the lady who deals with widows. And of course, she's a lady too. It makes it even easier. So a little bit of affinity there. So I know it, it kind of a little bit of a long story there. And, and the first logical thing is, well, I'm not a financial advisor. I can't target widows. And I totally get that. But there's so many similarities, right? It's where, you know, that's a, it's approximate. There's a very close proximity to the type of things that you're doing in your business and the things that an advisor is doing, right? There's uh, the populations of thousands and thousands of uh, advisors out there, thousands and thousands of ISOs out there fighting for business. Uh, similarly, uh, there's a lot of churn in the industry. Uh, I know for financial advisors, 85% uh, don't make it to year five. Very high washout rate. Uh, the industry in general will hire anybody who can fog a mirror. Basically, <laughs> if you're alive and got a pulse, uh, sign your name, you can become a financial advisor, right? You've seen the movies, you've seen Wolf of Wall Streets and the, and the like, and at, you know, uh, some of those days are over, but some of that stuff is somewhat similar to what goes on today. They'll hire anybody. Most of them wash out. Some of them survive and do very well. Um, everybody has the same product. This is one of the things that's really interesting. And I, I let this, I always like to let this sink in. Every financial advisor out there has the exact same products. I don't care if you're uh, Morgan Stanley, if you're an independent advisor, if you're you know, brokerage and custody with Fidelity or whatever, they all have access to all the same stocks, bonds, and mutual funds for the most part. There's some like proprietary funds, but by and large, same products. Similar for you, right? You are out there independently sourcing deals. Pearl Capital is one of the places you can place your deal. Uh, you like working with Pearl Capital, one of the reasons why you're here. Uh, Pearl Capital offers something for you, but they offer that same deal pretty much to all the other ISOs on the call and all the other ISOs in the world ha get similar uh, offerings and have access to the same product. So how do you differentiate yourself, right? You can't go out with the same message uh, and the same product to everybody uh, because it'll get watered down. You gotta come kind of bring in an advantage. Um, similar, you know, your customers are, have similar types of customers. Uh, again, I mentioned the 80-20 rule a little bit, like 20% of the ISOs are going to make crazy good money. Uh, the bottom 80%, we'll see what happens, right? But that's it's pretty similar in every single market in which we're dealing with financial professionals going out and sourcing deals. All right, so let's talk about defining your niche, right? How do you go about it to take, take aim at your specific target market? Because it's not always easy, right, uh, to think about what do you want to be? What type of business do you want to be in? Who do you want to serve, right? Uh, you, as I mentioned, you know, we don't want to leave business, you know, on the table that we could have closed. So I, I know that sometimes that's one of the reasons why people don't pay as much attention to the niche is they're worried that if they restrict their focus, that they may miss business, that they may be missing an opportunity. And that's really not true. Believe it or not, focusing on a niche, getting really good at that allows you to get really profitable, really efficient, and then you can start bringing on new customers from other niches if you want to. You can actually expand your, your search radius, if you will, uh, over time. But it's really important to get focused at the beginning. So it's a couple of little easy things I, I like to say. There's two buckets to what is a niche, right? First of all, it's easy to identify, right? Would your referral partner um, if you told them your CPAs that you talk to or whoever it is that you're interacting with in the world, uh, if they ask you to describe your ideal customer, could you do it like really quickly? What, what, would, what would you tell them? And then you think that they could recognize that customer when they bump into them on the street, right? Because we all want to do that. Like a good customer for me is anybody who does this. Like for me, it's like if you know somebody who runs a financial services firm, and they need help with their marketing, please help them talk to me. That's a really easy thing for Pearl Capital to say, hey, listen, if, if you know a small business owner uh, who needs capital, uh, we can help them with that solution. So they're a little more broad, right? But they're going through you as the ISO to go out and source those deals. So you have to have a little more of a laser-like focus. Uh, I like the little fun one here. We talked about uh, social at the beginning of this webinar. Could you describe your ideal customer and what you do for them in 140 characters? What's the tweet, right? Um, that's a really fun one. Give that a shot, by the way. 
Uh, Because you should be able to do that. You should be able to reply to somebody, I help X type of customer with raise capital fast for this reason or whatever. Uh, Can you find a group of your niche customers on social network or local meetups? That's a lot of the good litmus test. Pretty much if there's any type of target market that you have, chances are you'll be able to go onto a social network somewhere and find a group of those people congregating and sharing information. Uh, Just like for the ISO community, you can go to things like DeBank and so forth and find uh, of ISOs sharing stories and insights, uh, you'll find that for other segments as well. Uh, common needs is another good uh, value prop for evaluating uh, who's your ideal customer for our target market. Do, do, they, sh- they, uh, do they use the same language? And we'll, we'll cover that in a couple of screens uh, from now, but that's really important, right? Because not everybody refers to things the same way. And if you start using uh, language that's a little too generic, you might miss somebody, they might think you don't know their business, um, if you use something that's too specific for one vertical and you try to bring that to another vertical, they might look at you like you're a little crazy. Um, do they share common problems right, or, or opportunities? Are they looking for similar goals? Um, and then I, I really like to boil it down here. Like when you talk to someone in your niche, do they feel like you know their business? There is, there is nothing better than when a prospect looks you in the eye and, and that you catch them nodding along and they really feel like you know them and you maybe walked a mile in their shoes. It's a great way to build a, a robust relationship. Okay, so what's the difference? I mentioned that, you know, speaking their language and, and targeting them. Like, you know, both of these guys are small business owners. One owns a, a, an auto shop, one owns a restaurant. What's the difference, right? What do they call their customers or who are their customers, right? So in the, in the auto shop uh, owner's example, there's some kind of nice to have, right? Sometimes people want their maintenance done like an oil change is kind of a nice to have. It should be done, but you can skip it for a few thousand miles. But a huge chunk of their businesses needs to be done right now. I need my car. I got to commute. I got to work. I get the kids to school. Uh, it is not an option not to fix this. So it is a needs-based demand for that customer. So the way that he thinks of his customer is dramatically different than the way the restaurant owner thinks of the customer. Sure, like his customer needs to eat, but he doesn't need to eat there, right? If budget gets tight, he can avoid going out to the restaurant. He can't avoid eating, but he could get his food elsewhere, right? Go to the the grocery store and cook for himself if he needs to, right? So uh, it's a discretionary spend by and large for most restaurants. And that's a dramatic difference in their business and how they go about doing things. Uh, Employees, same thing. How do they get stuff done? At the auto shop, with the exception of maybe the person at the counter that welcomes you, it's all skilled labor, right? In, in my case, you know, gr- growing up, I worked in some a- auto shops during college. Um, it was all skilled labor, basically. The, the people that were there all knew how to do things in the shop in addition to welcoming a customer and checking them out at the cash register and so forth. Whereas a restaurant, there's some skilled labor. Sh- uh, sure, the chefs and the bartenders really know their craft, but the vast majority of the labor is unskilled the wait staff and the hostesses and dishwashers. And of course, you know, when we get into these restaurants that are really fancy and have been around for a, a millennia, right? The wait staff becomes pretty darn skilled, but by and large, we're dealing with unskilled labor uh, to a much higher degree with a restaurant. Same thing goes down. We'd start looking at things like the way that they, they uh, supply their business, right? Auto shops don't carry a lot of inventory by and large. They, what'll happen, you bring your car in to get fixed. They call the local auto parts dealer and get your, um, part and then it comes over sometime during the day and they put the part in your car and then off you go. So they don't carry a lot of inventory. Uh, that's completely different for the restaurant owner. They don't call out to the, the, the restaurant supply company and say, hey, listen, I need some steaks right now because I've got customers sitting at a table waiting for a steak. No, they have to have perishable inventory on hand. Dramatic difference in the business. And of course, the competition is a little bit different too, right? Uh, they're both significant, uh, but it's much harder for a restaurateur than, 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 than an auto shop. Like once an auto shop gets established, they're pretty much around forever, right? Unless something cataclysmic goes wrong. Uh, restaurants turn over like crazy because of competition, the fads and all that type of stuff. So I, 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 we, we spent a little time, extra time on this slide, but I think it really hits home that your customers are different. They don't all, even though they all have the same need for capital, they all, they, they're gonna have cash flow shortages at time. Uh, times that where a merchant cash advance could come in and really solve that problem, they think about their business different. Their business is different. The things that are going on in their day to day 
is dramatically different from one business to the next. And so if you can customize the way that you interact with them, if you can go in there with a full knowledge of what's happening in their business, you're going to be much better off. So how do you choose your niche? There's a bunch of different ways, but these are four ways that I have discovered work really well. And then you know, the, the most basic one is location. I know that many ISOs spend a lot of time dialing uh, for dollars, right? You're just really just ripping up the phone, calling any small business owner you can get uh, that'll answer uh, and trying to get them to call you back and see if they, they have the need for capital. And that's, that's a tried and true, you know, the boiler room style uh, business. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's just very laborious, right? It takes a lot of effort. Uh, and it has a low success rate, right? Because it, in some respects, it's, it's cold calls. Maybe you're working off a warmer list, but in many cases, from what I've seen, a lot of cold calling going on, and it doesn't always work really well. Well, location, stick, you know, finding a location that you can zero in on and, and serving a certain community uh, can really help you niche it down a little bit. Now, it depends. If you live in a super rural environment and there's maybe 10,000 people within a 200-mile radius of you, and we got some of that in Texas when you get out west, uh, maybe location is not the, <laughs> the best solution for you. But if you live in a bigger city, whether it's Austin or Houston or uh, the New York City area or whatever, you can drill down a location. Now, in those communities, you can also drill down in other areas, but location can be helpful, right? If you're in a, a town, a mid-sized city, there might be three or four other ISOs in that community that you have to compete with. And oh, great, you can just focus on the local small business community to be very active there and, and build a robust business because competition's law. Um, industry, great way, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, uh, the webinar, I focus on a specific industry, financial services. It's a really great way to do business. Find an industry that you like, that you think is vibrant, that there's lots of customers, and I'm going to show you how you can go about and do a little research on finding those customers, uh, or finding how big that industry is, excuse me. But find an industry you like, and it can be some connected industries, right? You could go after bars and restaurants or auto shops, auto body shops, and used car dealerships. So there, there's, or in parts suppliers, you could be in a vertical, a, a broader vertical, but get to know that industry and people will introduce you and, and you'll, you'll find it easier to penetrate the market. Affinity groups is another one commonly gets overlooked, but if you want to LinkedIn as an example, You'd be blown away by how many people you, you're connected with and how big the network is for your college or high school or whatever, right? Those alumni groups are huge and people love doing businesses, business, excuse me, with people who went to the same college. Here in Austin, it's ridiculous. It's, it's a college town, University of Texas, UT, the Hook'em Horns there, the Longhorns. It's insane. Everybody riding around with Longhorns and always have orange on <laughs> during game days and so forth, but it's a big deal. Uh, I went to Boston University. Uh, it's a, a mild deal, right? I don't know what a B, BU people aren't as, aren't as uh, crazy over their college, but as you see, anytime college football season rolls around or March Madness for basketball season rolls around, people are really into their college and they will, if given a choice, do business with somebody that went to the same school as them. That's a really hard thing to pass up. So I'd recommend spending a little time digging into uh, any groups that you may belong to, whether it's an alumni clubs or associations that you've been a part of, uh, jam on that. See what happens out of it. You can just, you can be, I, I, I serve small businesses and be more broad in that respect, but I only work with people primarily who went to University of Texas or Boston University or whatever school you went to. Uh, the last one is a specific problem or opportunity. You see this all the time, like dentists as an example, or uh, some of them are cosmetic dentists, right? So yeah, they're, they could do the other dentist stuff, but no, they only do crowns and veneers and the like. Uh, you see that with financial advisors. Some of them only focus on widows, right? Some of them do estate planning. Some of them are college planning advisors. So they start to focus on a very specific problem, challenge, or goal that the client may have, and they make all their marketing materials, all their outreach about that one solution. Think about what that does for your referral network. If you told somebody that you help small businesses secure capital quickly uh, when they need to repair a piece of equipment or when they need to get inventory in the door fast, that's an easier thing than saying, hey, I help small businesses get cash when they need cash, right? It's, it's let's be specific about it. 
because when it comes up and somebody says, oh man, I need to get more inventory, I'm, I'm kind of tapped for cash, somebody remembers that you're the one who sol solves it. And they're much more likely to Google that specifically, by the way. So it really makes things ha helpful. Okay, what's your superpower? <laughs> so this one came up because I, there's this, if you've ever seen the movie, The Incredibles, it's a Disney movie. I have two little kids, so I've seen it probably dozens of times, uh, as with all the other Pixar or Disney movies there. There's a scene in there. Uh, it's a family of superheroes, if you don't know the story. So it's a family of superheroes. Mom and dad are superheroes. It turns out the little kids have superpowers as well, and each of them has different superpowers. The son here, Dash, his superpower is he can run really fast, like like the Flash, if you remember the old days, you know, the Flash was a superhero who could run super duper fast. Dash is like that. Can run on water type of thing. And his mom's giving him a hard time in the car because he was running too fast at school and they don't want to reveal that they're superheroes. They're trying to be like incognito in the community and not let everybody know that they're supers because supers are kind of out of fashion at the moment. So she's saying, you know, uh, you know, uh, just don't do, you know, just, just be normal, whatever, chill out. And she says, you know, everybody's special, though. Everybody's special. And he replies back, uh, saying everybody's special is just another way of saying that nobody is. And that really hit me as I started thinking about putting this presentation together. If you're using the same marketing message to the same mass market of small business owners that every single other ISO is using out there, that's not super, right? A little corny to say it that, but it's, it's not going to stand out. It's, it, you're not going to cut through the noise of all the other ISOs out there trying to win business because they're all putting the same generic message out there. We've got to find a way to put something out that is much more specific and it's going to an audience that is going to resonate, identify that message and think you're incredible. Okay. I've beaten that fun analogy to death, but it was a good one, right? Okay, so claim your niche, right? Think of your niche as your audience. How would you pack a room for your show? And I know many, many business people don't think of it that way, but this it is, you have an audience. People are listening to you. You're an influencer. You're solving problems for them. You know, you're not just a salesperson calling them up, trying to pester them, right? You're trying to solve a real problem for them and help them succeed, right? Who resonates best? How do we get those people in a room? Let's figure out a couple of ways to do that. So the first thing to do is figure out, is your niche big enough? Right? We don't want it to be that 5.4 million small businesses. That makes us feel good, like there's an endless supply of potential customers out there, but it's not necessarily the best way to articulate a niche. Uh, we want one that's big enough where we don't run through our list within a couple of days, but not so big where we can't really target it. So some places to research. I like all of them. Uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the BLS.gov website, has some fan, and it's linked here, and I'll have, uh, Grant will send out a, a copy of this in PDF form, and you'll be able to hyperlink on this, so anything you see underlined, you've got to click on that and go check out these links, and hopefully they're useful to you. But the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, in, in conjunction with the, the Census Bureau, gets some fantastic data, and they make it available for free online. And one of the things you can do on the BLS website is find out how many companies are in a certain industry, a specific vertical, down to the specific general area that you're in, right? The, the geographic area you're in. So you can find out how many nail salons are in the Austin area. You can find out how many auto repair shops are in the Austin area and ask yourself, is X whatever, like if there's 2000, is that a big enough market for you? Okay, well, if it's not a big enough market, do I adjust the niche and say, I don't wanna just focus on auto shops or do I wanna go bigger than Austin? Maybe I wanna include San Antonio, or maybe I wanna include Houston or what have you, but you can adjust things a little bit and get a sense of how big it is. You can also get a sense when you start digging in there, you'll, you'll see some total value, see the number of people employed as well uh, in, in, in those industries to get a sense of like the actual scale of that market. Uh, Google's another really good tool. So it, one of the things that's really uh, not focused on as much with Google is that it's got a location-based search. So you can search and you can search for businesses near me, right? So you can make it be location specific. So instead of searching for auto repair, you can search for auto repair Austin, Texas or auto repair near me. And sure enough, it'll bring up stuff that's closer to you. you can, and you can count the results 
you can get a sense for uh, what some of their things, you know, what, what, what they're selling, what their marketing message looks like uh, and, and the like. And so that'll help you identify your niche a little better. Uh, industry organizations is, is a good one. Tiny little story on this. This one cracked me up. Uh, about seven or eight years or so ago, I went to a conference in Orlando and it was for financial advisors. And uh, there was another conference going on in the same hotel. And I, I was like, where are all these people here? What kind of conference is this? So I just happened to see somebody, one of the women that was at the conference. And I, I just asked her, hey, what are you guys here for? We're doing an advisor conference. And she's like, oh, it's, it's for um, pallets. I'm like, what? She's like, oh yeah, yeah, pallet manufacturers in the industry. I'm like, what do you mean, like pallet, like pallets, like that you, like forklifts you use, like they put products on. She's like, yep, it's a, it's a conference. There's hundreds of people at this conference. The whole industry is like, and this is just one, by the way. I just went out, I googled this and found this in five seconds. Uh, that the Pallet Central, it's a, it's an organization of pallet manufacturers and, and packing equipment, whatever uh, makers. Uh, you can go check it out. But I, real quick, I clicked on the About Us page over there, and it said something like 676 members in the United States to this organization. Like 676 companies in the United States make pallets. It's fascinating, right? So whatever or industry you're targeting, you can find an industry group, and then, wow, your little job just got so much easier to dive in and get to know about those people. You can go show up at their conference and, and get to know them as well. Uh, I'm sure some of them have like relatively cheap sponsorship opportunities as well to let, let them know. Um, LinkedIn's a great one. You can search by industry. Uh, Yelp as well uh, is another great one. Uh, Yelp gets overlooked, right? If you're, if, if you're targeting businesses that are any, in any way, shape, or form retail focused, whether it's a restaurant, most people think of Yelp as a restaurant thing, but they, they'll have hair salons in there, uh, retail stores, just about anything that's retail focused, you'll find Yelp uh, results in there. And that'll really help you a little bit. Uh, see what's going on with the business too, because you can read the reviews and find out which businesses are in trouble and which businesses are doing really well. All right, so we talked about uh, fishing where the fish are, right? So how do I get in front of these people? Well, it's fantastic that I know that I have a niche that I've thought about it and I know it's big enough. Um, I'm going to go after auto repair shops in the Austin area. There's hundreds of them. It's awesome. It's going to be a great business for me. How do I make sure that I uh, get my message in front of them? Well, there's a lot of different ways. You, you can obviously do the traditional me methodology of calling and visiting and, and so forth and trying to uh, build up their business. But there are Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups for every industry you can imagine. And, and many of them are local. Like I know here in Austin, for instance, you know, if your target market was startups, right? In Austin, there's an Austin startups group on Facebook. It's got a few thousand people in it. So you could just target that group if you were, had a business that was selling to startups and just, I know you guys don't sell the startups, but still, just the general gist is you could find a group that targets your niche and spend all day in there answering questions and, and interacting with people and become the boss when it comes to uh, finding alternative means of funding for uh, short-term cash needs. Meetup.com is one of my favorites, unsung hero of the niche marketing world. Meetup.com is a website. Uh, I'm not sure if you've ever used it, but if you ever have, you've, you've gone to some sort of uh, event where you might hear somebody speaking or it's, a, or it's a happy hour type of event or whatever, but there is a meetup for everything imaginable, for music store owners, for people who'd like to be in uh, the craft brewing industry or whatever that is. You can find a meetup and you can go hang out where the fish are, hang out in the same room with the people that you want to market to and build your network that way. Other websites as well, you know, Reddit's a good one. Uh, Quora, uh, I didn't list that here, but Quora is a, a question and answer website. Lots of good stuff that can be industry specific there. Uh, industry forums, right? So as I mentioned before, every industry has got uh, conferences uh, and they've got uh, industry groups. They also have forums on their website. You guys spend time in the debanked forums and other forums. Uh, guess what? Restaurant owners have restaurantowner.com and a bunch of others that they, they spend time in. Uh, so go out and, and get yourself ensconced in that in that community. So connecting with your customers is the next thing to do. I mentioned this a little bit before, but you know, make sure you're speaking their language. So when you sp start spending time with them, whether it's in person at a meetup or in the groups online and so forth, you'll start to see common language. But before I started working with Pearl Capital, I'd never heard the, the, the term ISO, right? Like, or ISO, however you want to use it. And uh, it, 
I had to go Google it. And sure enough, it, the first things that come up are not ISO, right? ISO is like a, 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 is a safety deal uh, for uh, OSHA and so forth. So ISO compliant or something of that nature. So you have to do a little digging to find out what ISO stands for. And that's really important. If you're going to start doing business in an industry in a specific niche, you want to make sure that you're speaking the same language as the people you're going to try to talk to. I use the simple example of, do they call their customer a client or they call them a customer or they call them a patron or they call them a member? It matters. It really, really matters to them that you're speaking their language, that you understand what their business is, is, is like. Um, having empathy, feeling their pain, knowing what they're going through. Right? You, you, if you start talking to people in the same business over and over and over again, you're going to find that the same pain points come up and you're going to be able to hit it up front. And nothing resonates better with your audience than you in the early part of the conversation going, you know, I was talking to another person in whatever that industry is, auto shop, and he experienced this type of problem. And here's how we solved it. I want to make sure we can do the same thing for you. That type of thing that is this old sales technique. You've probably used it. It's called feel, felt, found. You know, here's, 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 uh, here's, I know how you feel. Um, I felt the same way, or I know people who have felt the same way, but here's what I found. Here's the solution, right? That, that is a classic sales tool. It works well in your marketing efforts as well. Uh, networking with complementary business provi uh, providers. You know, we talked about this with the, the, the lady who says she likes widows. She's spending all her time and it sounds morbid, but she's all up in the death business, right? <laughs> she spends a lot of time around uh, the recently deceased or the, or the survivors of, of people who were recently deceased. And as a result, uh, she, she knows the industry really well. She's the first person that they, they think of uh, when somebody has a need. And we want that for you as well. And being specific in your marketing. This one is so important, right? I told you about the, the tweet, you know, uh, we help X, X bit type of businesses with this Y problem. If you can say that about your business, it's a really good uh, way to be. A uh, little bonus here. I, I think I read this as a book, but for some reason I can only find it on uh Amazon in audiobook format. So it might be out of print. But uh, the author, Thomas Stanley here, is also one of the guys who wrote a book. It was a best selling book called The Millionaire Next Door, in which they studied millionaires across America and, and, and the, the behaviors, the habits, and you know, their average age, how, how did they become millionaires, and all the, the other variables you might expect. And really good stuff. You know, you know, some of the things you'll find out in that book was that millionaires aren't always like these stereotypes you think they are. They typically drive used cars. They typically drive, uh, drink domestic beer. They've never paid more than $400 for a suit. Uh, they typically are business owners. They typically became millionaires in their 40s. So it took them 20 years to become millionaires, all this and that, live below their means. So this, this follow-up book, Networking with Millionaires and Their Advisors, was really, really powerful to me as well. A lot of stories tell them there about how to make sure you can get in the right room with millionaires, but you can apply the same stuff to the small business owner in your niche. But one of the things that's really interesting uh, that really stood out to me was the, the, the story he told of, of the top insurance salesman. And the insurance salesman was supposed to get some sort of award for being the top salesman of the year. And he was not going to go to the conference to accept his award. Instead, he was going to be at the racetrack uh, where he, he sold insurance policies to a lot of race car drivers. And so he thought the best use of his time instead of getting the award and, and getting the pat on the back from his, from his uh, uh, colleagues would be spent, uh, he's never, he says, he says he's never sold an insurance policy at an insurance convention, but when he's at the races, he's always selling insurance. So be where your customers are, find a way to be there. So a really good read. Uh, if you have the moment, uh, go ahead and check it out. Okay. Being targeted and specific. Uh, I'm a married man, happily married man, been married for over 20 years. I've never used one of these sites. But I was think, trying to think of an example uh, to share with you that really hammered home the point of making sure that your marketing message is on, on point and uh, how much more efficient, efficient and effective it can be for you, especially if you're a smaller ISO that doesn't have a huge marketing budget. So these two dating sites, you've almost certainly heard their advertisements when you're watching TV or listening to the radio. And you, if you're single, I'm sure you've seen them in your, your streams and, and, and Google and so forth when you're, when you're out there. If you're, I'm probably going to see them now because I clicked on uh, these websites to go visit them. So I'm sure I'm going to get followed around the world. Uh, so one's match.com, the most popular uh, dating site out there, uh, very mass market appeal. And the other one is farmers only. 
you know, you've seen other ones like Christian Mingle and um, there's one for African Americans. And so that they, they really kind of vary on their focuses, but I chose the farmers only one. Maybe it's a Texas thing. I'm becoming more Texan every day, I guess. So uh, farmers only, who would have thought, right? Uh, that there's a website for people who are uh, want to date other farmers or other rural folks. Uh, but it's really, really effective, right? Because if you're a rural person uh, and farmers have, uh, and people who live in rural communities tend to have a certain uh, value syst uh, system that it might be a little different than your massmarketmatch.com folks, uh, you know you're going to find a certain type of person there, right? So it's it's resonating. What I thought was really interesting, though, is when you go take a look at some of their data. So this is from a website called SpyFu. It, it'll look at some of the analytics data uh, for their Google spend, their advertising spend, and the traffic that they're getting. And what I thought was fascinating is, you know, Match.com is spending $126,000 a month estimated on their Google AdWords budget. And it's resulting in um, 95,000 clicks a month and so forth. But what's really fascinating is uh, Farmers Only only spends $3,500 a month, right? And they get a lot less clicks, but Match.com spent 35 times what Farmers Only spent, but they only got a 16x increase in results. And now I have no idea like what the end result is, right? Uh, I know that uh, Farmers Only is doing much better on organic clicks, which is people who go to their site organically versus uh, in proportion to uh, those who come via paid. So that's awesome. But uh, it's pretty amazing that they're getting a very good return on their investment in terms of visitors, uh, spending a lot less money uh, because they've chosen to focus on a niche. And I hope that you'll do some of that as well. Okay. So we've got about 10 minutes left. I've got my last slide here, which is kind of your assignment. I did this for the social media podcast, uh, webinar, excuse me, and we do that here again as well. Uh, so the next 30 days between our next webinar, we will have an, another webinar at the end of next month, and I'd love for you to come back. Uh, and if you have things you want to make sure we cover, uh, please do uh, tell us. Uh, but next steps, right? To find your niche. Try it. Don't give up the rest of your whole business, right? Ease into it. Find a niche that you would like to explore, that you're ha you have an interest in, uh, that you notice there's a lot of businesses around you that uh, that, that have uh, certain attributes, go get them, right? Start building connections on social media within that niche. Spend some time, right? Go follow people who own auto shops or hair salons or restaurants uh, that you know are relatively close to you. Become uh, part of their life. Now, you're going to try to sell them, of course, at some point in time, but just get to know them. Become part of their community. I recommend attend a meetup with folks from your niche. See if you can find one. And by the way, if you can't find one, start one. I host an event here in Austin during the South by Southwest uh, festival every year. I have about 250 to 300 people come through and it brings in a lot of business. And it costs me almost nothing, nothing to throw this event on. I get a couple of little sponsors. Now it's an annual event, but I've also recently started hosting a happy hour. I pay nothing for that other than the cost of my drinks. I just was the guy who organized it. And sure enough, lots of people from the financial services ecosystem here in Austin show up to the happy hour. It's great, right? It's a free marketing it. Everybody remembers, Mike's the guy who puts it together. He's the guy who does marketing. If we need to talk to somebody about marketing or I need to talk, uh, send somebody his way for marketing in the financial services vertical, send it to Mike. Uh, Discover common problems and opportunities. See if you can actually write them down, right? So if you decide to go after restaurants, as an example, see if like over the next month, if you can have a little notebook with some common problems that people in that industry have and common opportunities they're looking for and think to yourself, how might you solve that? And then lastly, think about re rewording, uh, reworking your, your marketing materials and sales script for your niche. What words might you choose to put in there? If you know, it's a client versus customer versus member and so forth, go on down the list. Like, how can I reword this to make it much more targeted for my niche? And then let's start testing it out. Uh, lastly, a bonus read. Again, the link's here. Uh, Grant will send this out via, um, via PDF. You can click on this. Seven ways to find your target audience on Twitter. Uh, once again, if you, if you like the webinar today, uh, feel free to tweet it out. Use that niche pearl uh, uh, hashtag. Uh, do follow uh, Pearl Capital on Twitter uh, and go ahead and, and read that seven ways to find your target audience on Twitter. It's a really great because Twitter is a public network, right? You can follow people and interact with people relatively quickly. 
So that's what I have for you today. I uh, really hope this was useful and valuable to you. If you have questions, I'm going to hang out here for a little bit until uh, we have to hang. Uh, if, if it allows us to stay a few minutes longer, I'll stay and answer questions. So if you have questions, please do feel free to type them in the, the Q&A box. I'm, I'm watching it live here. Happy to answer any of them. You can come uh, to finservemarketing.com or you can, my email is right here on this last slide. If you would prefer to send me a question directly to have answered, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, there are no, right, dumb questions, right? Everybody is uh, new at some time. Everybody, you know, is going to come up to speed on certain things at some time. So please do ask them. And if I don't know the answer, I'll say I don't know and I'll see if I can help uh, find the answer for you. Okay. So uh, if there's no more questions, I'm going to, I will go ahead and sign off. The, uh, again, the email is here. Please feel free to email me, Mike at uh, FinServe Marketing. Uh, please do visit ProCapital.com. Uh, their 1 800 number here is on the, on the last slide. Uh, if you have, uh, questions if you have anything that's specific to your business oh do i have my own email server no i don't i use the third-party service um, um we actually use mailchimp although we may be changing to a more advanced solution but mailchimp has been fine for us um and it's really not that expensive um uh, i'm looking for a few different venues hold on a second we've got jack uh he's considering uh uh billboards jack i'm gonna tell you um one of the most effective billboard places in the world I kid you not in the bathroom you think it, it, it sounds ridiculous um i can almost hear people laughing on the call uh bathrooms if you ever go to a bathroom and you're a gentleman and you're using the bathroom and you're standing there and there's a, an advertisement right in front of you uh you have no choice but to look <laughs> Uh, I have seen them, uh, you know, in front of the urinal. I've seen them uh, on the back of the stall doors. Uh, again, if you're targeting the right community, if you know that the small business community is coming in there with, in your vertical, uh, and you're putting an advertisement there, and it's it's a classic thing. Put your advertisement where the eyeballs are, and you're going to succeed. Classic billboards on the side of the road are getting uh, are challenging right now because a lot of people, uh, first of all, people don't are moving too fast to look. And then when they're sitting at a stoplight, they're no longer looking up at billboards, they're looking at their phone. I, I, don't, I, I couldn't tell you a single billboard anywhere near me that's on the side of the road, but I could tell you uh, the advertisements that are in the, in the bathroom at the coffee shop that I went to uh, not too long ago. One was for a boat rental, like you can rent boats to zip around on Lake Travis here. Um, and another one was for zip lining. Uh, you could do, there's like a zip lining adventure -y type deal here. Uh, in Austin. And the oh, third one here, this shows, goes to show you how good it was. Uh, there's Austin biplane, which is a, it's a, one of old fashioned Red Baron planes uh, where you can take that out for the day and go out with, your, your, with, with uh, the two of you and get an uh, aerial view of Austin. So how good was that? Because what? I was using the bathroom and I had nowhere else to look. So <laughs> uh, there you go. Uh, so yes, billboards in the bathroom. Let's see. Okay. Uh, I think that's the last one there. Uh, yes, so wonderful webinar today. Thank you so very much for the, uh, your time today. I, I know you have other things to do and I really do respect your time and I value that you, you've carved out this chunk of your day. Uh, hope to make the most of it. If there is anything you'll wanna see more of, if there's anything you're even slightly disappointed of and you, and you wish we had covered, please don't hesitate to give that feedback. Uh, it's all taken in good stride and an opportunity to hopefully improve things, right? I'm putting out there what I think is really valuable and based on my research and, and, and my knowledge of the space, but you know, there might be something I missed. Like I didn't think about the billboards and so forth. So please do uh, let me know. Please ask your questions to me uh, about the marketing side and ask the stuff product wise to the pro capital team. All right. Looking forward to seeing you next month. Have a wonderful rest of your day and enjoy your weekend. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks.